parents and apparently up to and including the tender age of Meg Pearson call it a humble brag. But the last time I gave a TED Talk, I looked like this. I'll give everyone four guesses as to what the subject of my talk was. A, my year as a real life Mrs. Doubtfire. B, the art and science of not bathing ever. C, 50 shades of my premature gray. Or D, <laughs> duck calls. So, a tremendous amount has changed since this photograph, personally and professionally. Um, not just the length and volume of the gray. Uh, I've made some really tremendous or really significant personal mistakes. Uh, I've also made some great choices, most notably, I still practice law, just no longer with the federal court. I'm an assistant United States attorney, and I prosecute violations of federal criminal law. But, and I, I cannot emphasize this enough today, I am merely illustrative. In the state and throughout the country, there are assistant United States attorneys who are better, more able, much, much longer tenured, and clearly capable of a whole lot more basic personal hygiene than myself. <laughs> and so, I think it's important, probably useful to start with a brief civics lesson. You all might recall from your government class, or not, we have two parallel systems, state and federal both with their own laws and jurisdictions, some of which overlap and some of which are distinct. The Department of Justice is the law enforcement agency of the executive branch of the federal government, which is the law enforcement branch of our federal government. The U.S. attorneys are the prosecutorial arm, the prosecutors for the Department of Justice, but in each of the respective states. So in this state, we have one U.S. attorney, Ms. Beth Drake, and then under her, various assistant United States attorneys like myself. At the state level or on your television, you would know them as solicitors or district attorneys. All this to say I'm an example, not necessarily representative of, but an example of many, many more. So I do need to pause here real briefly for a quick legal disclaimer. Certainly none of you all thought you were going to escape today without some limitation of liability. But everything I say is in my personal capacity, my own personal view, not any official or particular view of the Department of Justice, the administration, or any of its constituent members. Now, by virtue of your attendance here today, you have consented to a permanent lifelong wiretap. And on your way out, a very, very deep body cavity search. <laughs> so it's, it's not any sort of news, the recent and mostly bipartisan attention given to the issue of mass incarceration. 1973, there were roughly 200,000 prisoners in this country. As of 2015, there were 2.3 million prisoners in this country. We have 4% of the world's population but we house 20% of the world's prison population. This phenomenon has been dubbed mass or over-incarceration. And as I refer to the problem in criminal justice, today, that's the issue to which I'm referring. The similar written work redirecting much of the public's attention on this issue is by a former federal prosecutor, Michelle Alexander, called The New Jim Crow. There's been a recent documentary, The 13th, which powerfully depicts this predicament. And there's been a number of TED Talks already, specifically in the space, Brian Stevenson, The Equal Justice Initiative, Adam Foss, a Massachusetts state prosecutor, and our very own TEDx curator, Caroline Caldwell Richmond. And all these are necessary reading for my talk, although it's not my intent to revisit the underlying problem, it cannot be emphasized enough, 2.3 million prisoners in our country. Rather, I'd like to pick up on this important story and add some additional value and perspective, especially at this very critical, important political and cultural time in our US history. And so I'd like to do three things. First and primarily, I'd like to make the case that real systemic, systemic change is almost always an inside job. The societal institutions themselves must be willing to change either by force or feeling in commiseration. The revolution must be reciprocated from the seat of power. Second, I'd like to do a little show and tell about what federal prosecutors are actually doing to improve your criminal justice system. And third, for all these reasons, beg your political and civic patience and calm. As to the first, bureaucrats are revolutionaries too. We typically think about societal change as revolutionary in a function of the rebel and the change agent and the reformer, king. Gandhi, Du Bois, X, Snowden. We think about militant resistance versus nonviolent protest, cyber attacks, Selma Bridge, Standing Rock, WikiLeaks, Anonymous. We think about the people versus the power. Public enemy, bring the noise, fight the power, class conflict. We think about those without any authority versus those with authority. We think about this very moment in U.S. history, UC Berkeley, women's marches, Twitter bullying, Ferguson, Black Lives Matter. 
We think about the community versus the cops, versus law enforcement, versus the system. Along with others, I'd like to suggest today that our reform and our revolution can be community plus the cops, plus law enforcement in parallel with the system. Indeed, history suggests that it must. King marched and judges ordered. Rosa sat, Johnson and Kennedy signed. For every revolutionary and community activist along the picket line, there was some bureaucrat or suit or elected official on the inside. I think the greatest example of a system revolutionary is Mandela himself. No persecuted reformer I would suggest today in history has ever seized so much power after suffering so much persecution and declined so much retribution. And yet when he was released from prison, he worked within the existing political system, invited his political enemies to the table, participated in the writing of a constitution, and used and delivered reform through the vehicle and the mechanism of democracy when he could have, burnt, when he could have and maybe even should have burned it all to the ground. The criminal justice system is like an essential but massive naval vessel out at sea. Not the Department of Justice as a bureaucracy, but literally the entire systemic process. It's got some wear and tear. Most people agree that it's off course to one extent or another, has some barnacles, maybe some old technology. And revolutionaries and community activists have literally been hanging off of its hull, scraping tediously individual barnacles one at a time, maybe trying to paddle against its powerful engines. Some even hope that they can pirate the ship, Caroline Caldwell Richmond. But it's too big to move by external force. The crew itself has to be a part of the redirection. Where community entities and groups can focus on one or two parts, typically to extreme frustration and consternation of the criminal justice problem. Maybe early childhood education or job placement for individuals after they return from prisoner. A prosecutor is actually uniquely positioned to impact and interface with individuals all along what is called the sequential intercept model or the whole ship, so to speak. The sequential intercept model maps a continuum of five points of intervention with citizens and individuals who violate the law. The first intercept is prevention and law enforcement. Before anybody ever violates the law, can we intervene in their lives and make some sort of difference? The second intercept is detention. At the moment where there's reason to believe someone has violated the law, can we still intervene in their lives and make a difference? The third intercept is courts and jail. After someone is admitted or it's been proven that they violated the law, can we intervene in their lives and make a meaningful difference? The fourth intercept is reentry. After someone's paid the consequences for violating the law, can we intervene in their lives and make a difference? And finally, community support, can we intervene in their lives and make sure that they never violate the law again, which is to return full circle to the first intercept, prevention and law enforcement. And with some irony, there's no entity better equipped to impact at each point along this continuum than law enforcement, not community activists, not educators, not church leaders, not the media where they can impact, again, to often great frustration at one or two points, a prosecutor can impact, not completely, but in part, at each point. Indeed, in rendering community safety, which is our mandate, it is our solemn obligation to make exactly that kind of difference all along the way. In the words of my legal mentor, the Honorable Brucey e. Howe Hendricks, this is not new, it is ancient. It is part of our common law heritage, heritage as federal prosecutors. Our duty is to the citizen, law-abiding or not, to be aware of the use of power and to have the courage not to use power. So your federal prosecutors are in your schools talking with students about bullying and gun violence and the tremendous opioid epidemic. Last year in this state, 25,000 students were reached with those messages. Your federal prosecutors are in the community with state probationers offering social services to incentivize them to stay out of trouble and avoid violating the law again. Your federal prosecutors are in mosques and you're with religious communities who've been the target and the victim of hate crime discrimination. In the courtroom, your federal prosecutors are charging more proportionally, indicting nonviolent offenders more carefully and where appropriate, looking for alternatives to incarceration like drug courts, veterans courts, mental health courts, and pretrial diversion. In six years of operation, the federal drug court in this state which is one of the first and most nationally recognized of its kind, has saved over three and a half million dollars in taxpayer savings by helping over 50 defendants maintain sobriety and avoid lengthy prison sentences. But even once a defendant is sentenced, the courtroom is not the end of the intervention. Your federal prosecutors are behind the fence in juvenile facilities and state prisons 
and federal correctional institutions talking with prisoners about their release, considering clemency petitions, hosting job fairs, helping with identification and documentation necessary for a successful return home. In the last 12 months, over 800 individuals in the state have been reached with those resources in this state. The point of the day is not that system players or federal prosecutors are the most important or the only reformers and revolutionaries. And although as a middle-aged white male government bureaucrat, I certainly and almost cartoonishly embody him, I am not here to shill for the man. From the Civil War to the civil rights movement in terms of reform, activists have shed the most important blood in U.S. history. But just USA leadership has a critical motto. It says, those closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but they are furthest from the resources and the power. And so today we need a model of change and expectation about revolution that all along this continuum brings system resources to the problem solver, victims of the problem, historical victims of the problem, alongside historical keepers of the problem, those without authority with those in authority. And so no matter what you fear or see on your television, these are the faces of some of the individuals who serve your country. Committed to better and more complete justice. In the courtroom and in the classroom, from youth to post-incarceration, there is no more important time for the federal prosecutor to seize their full and quasi-judicial responsibility as curators of community safety and criminal process to be system players that honor the system even as they seek to improve it. We hear the revolution in the streets and make it the standard operating procedure on the shelves. So without taking a poll, I realize today that the composition of this room is more likely system player in your respective spheres of influence than reformer, more rule follower than it is revolutionary. So the question is how will you be a part of bringing your system resources to those without any? Thank you.